Please rise. Look, my servant will succeed. He will rise. He will be lifted up. He will be highly exalted. Just as many were appalled at him, his appearance was so disfigured that he did not look like a man, and his form was disfigured more than any other person. So he will sprinkle many nations, and kings will shut their mouths because of him, because they will see something they had never been told before, and they will understand something they had never heard before. Who has believed our report, and to whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? He grew up before him like a tender shoot, and like a root from dry ground. He had no attractiveness, no majesty. When we saw him, nothing about his appearance made us desire him. He was despised and rejected by men, a man who knew grief, who was acquainted with suffering, like someone whom people cannot bear to look at. He was despised, and we thought nothing of him. Surely he was, has, was taking up our weaknesses, and he was carrying our sufferings. We thought it was because of God that he was stricken, smitten, and afflicted. But it was because of our rebellion that he was pierced. He was crushed for the guilt of our sin that our sins deserved. The punishment that brought us peace was upon him, and by his wounds we are healed. We all have gone astray like sheep. Each of us has turned to his own way, but the Lord has charged all our guilt to him. He was oppressed, and he was afflicted. Yet he did not open his mouth. Like a lamb he was led to the slaughter, and like a sheep that is silent in front of its shears, he did not open his mouth. He was taken away without fair trial and without justice, and of his generation, who even cared? So he was cut off from the land of the living. He was struck down because of the rebellion of my people. They would have assigned him a grave with the wicked, but he was given a grave with the rich in his death because he had done no violence and no deceit was found in his mouth. Yet it was the Lord's will to crush him and to allow him to suffer. Because you made his life a guilt offering, he will see offspring, he will prolong his days, and the Lord's gracious plan will succeed in his hand. After his soul experiences anguish, he will see the light of life. He will provide satisfaction. Through their knowledge of him, my servant will justify the many, and he himself will carry their guilt. Therefore, I will give him an allotment among the great, and with the strong he will share plunder, because he poured out his life to death and he let himself be counted with rebellious sinners. He himself carried the sin of many, and he intercedes for the rebels. This is the word of our Lord. You may be seated as we sing the two verses of our hymn, Stricken, Smitten, and Afflicted.
The first word of our Lord from the cross, from Luke 23. Two other men who were criminals were led away with Jesus to be executed. When they came to the place called the skull, they crucified him there with the criminals, one on his right and the other on his left. Jesus said, Father, forgive them, for they do not know what they are doing. They cast lots to divide his garments among them. Dogs surround me. A pack of villains encircles me. They take your hands and my feet. They divide my garments among them. And he has lots for my clothing. He bore the sin of many. And they made intercession for the transgressors. Gracious Savior, you did not strike back with revenge against your enemies as they ridiculed and crucified you, but prayed for their forgiveness. In your compassion, pardon us for our secret sins and sins we do not discern, and enlighten us to know and do your will. Amen. We respond with our next hymn. The second word of our Lord from the cross, from Luke 23. The people stood watching. 
the rulers were ridiculing him, saying, he saved others. Let him save himself. If this is the, if this is the Christ of God, the chosen one. The soldiers also made fun of him. Coming up to him, they offered him sour wine, saying, If you are the king of the Jews, save yourself. There is also an inscription written above him, This is the king of the Jews. One of the criminals hanging there was blaspheming him, saying, Aren't you the Christ? Save yourself and us. But the other criminal rebuked him, Don't you fear God, since you are under the same condemnation. We are punished justly, for we are receiving what we deserve for what we have done. But this man has done nothing wrong. Then he said, Jesus, remember me when you come into your kingdom. Jesus said to him, Amen, I tell you. Today you will be with me in paradise. All who see me mock me. They hurl insults, shaking their heads. He trusts in the Lord, they say. Let the Lord rescue him. Let him deliver him, since he delights in him. Remember me, Lord, when you show favor to your people. Mighty Redeemer, remember us as we walk through the darkest valleys of this life and realize that our time on earth is ending. Stay close to us when we feel the pain and loneliness of dying and take away our fears with your certain promise of paradise. Grace, mercy, and peace to you from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ, my fellow redeemed. It's impossible. He can't possibly say those words. He can't possibly keep such a promise. Just look at the situation. He's there on the cross, hanging there, Nails have been driven through his hands and through his feet. He can barely talk. He was barely strong enough to carry the cross as he went there. He stumbled beneath its weight. How can he make any promise? How can he make any guarantee? And everyone standing there sees it. They all hurl insults at him. All who see him mock him. Ah, he saved others, but he can't save himself. If you are the Christ, if you are the Son of God, come down from the cross, and then, then we'll believe in you. Even one of the criminals continues to hurl insults at him again and again. Aren't you the one they call the Christ? Aren't you that miracle worker that everyone's been talking about? Well, now's a good time for a miracle. If you are the Son of God, save yourself. And while you're at it, save us too. And yet, he bears it all in silence. should be impossible. After all, he was a criminal. He was condemned. He was there because of what he had done, and he knew it. He was guilty, and he felt the guilt of that sin deep in his heart. He knew that there was no hope for someone like him. You see, he had tried cursing those soldiers and they ignored him. He tried begging and they only laughed. 
And now as his pain grew, as all of his muscles screamed, as his joints pulled, as his breath became sharp and painful, and he didn't know how much longer he would be able to speak before his breath came only in moans. He heard that criminal blaspheming him. And he had had enough. Don't you fear God. Don't you see what's happening here? We are going to die. We are under the same condemnation and we are getting what we deserve for what we have done. We are going to die. We are going to stand before the Lord. And what will we possibly have to say to him? Is this how you want to spend your final breaths? And then he looked at the other man, the man who hung next to him, the man in the middle. And he was nothing like anyone standing there. He wasn't like any of those who were mocking him, and he certainly wasn't like that criminal that hung there. He, if anything, was in worse shape than any of them. He stumbled so badly they had to get someone else to carry his cross. And yet, as the women were mourning for him on his way, he had compassion on them. While the soldiers drove those nails into his wrists, into his feet, he prayed, Father, forgive them. He refused to curse. He did not beg. He refused the wine mixed with gall that would dull his pain. He endured all that mockery, all of that insult, and he endured it in patient silence. He was different. This man, he has done nothing wrong. Not only is he innocent of the crime for which he has been accused, not only has he done nothing deserving this death, but he has never even done anything out of place. He has done nothing wrong. Then he looked at Jesus and he shouldn't have been able to speak to him. Not if Jesus is who people said he is. Not if Jesus is who Jesus claimed to be. How could a criminal speak to the Messiah? How could a criminal speak to the Son of God? How could he address the one that is rightly called the King of the Jews? But how could he not? Jesus, remember me. When you come into your kingdom. And that impossible request went to the Lord. And that thorn encircled head turned to him. And he spoke those impossible words. Amen. I tell you the truth. Amen, today you shall be with me in paradise. Now, of course, those words are impossible for all those reasons that we've already discussed, but they're also impossible for this. Look at the man to whom Jesus was speaking. Look at us. How could those words possibly be true for us? For we know what our sins deserve. We know what our sins have caused. We, who do so much wrong in this world, we who let so much evil pass by unnoticed, we who don't do those good things that God has given us to do, we, who have caused so much hurt and pain, not only in the lives of strangers, but in the lives of the people we love, we who place so many things 
above our Lord and our God who created us for his own glory. And we have turned our back on him. We, like sheep, have gone astray. Those words should be impossible. Except Jesus is who he said he is. Jesus is who they mock him for being. And so Jesus remains on that cross. He appears helpless. He appears to be unable to save himself. But he is only unable to save himself because he is there to save you. He is there to save sinners. He is there to save that criminal. He is there to save me. He is there to bring forgiveness to those who torment him. And so he is there for their salvation, for your salvation. And so the only one who could possibly make such a promise, he is the one who speaks from the cross. Amen. I tell you the truth. The last time he will say, I tell you the truth before he dies. I tell you the truth. You can count on this. You can know this. You can believe this. You can trust this. This is the Lord's promise, his guarantee. Amen. And so it shall be. Amen. Today. Not tomorrow. Not someday. Not maybe. Not after you have made up for all the things that you have done not after you have waited a certain amount of time today. Amen. Today, you. You who are sinners. You who suffer in this sinful world. You who are drawing near death. You who walk through that dark valley. You. Amen, today you will be with me. The temple curtain will tear in two because all that separates the sinners from God has been removed. With me, the Lord of light who created all things will welcome the crown of his creation back to himself, now glorified because he has shared our flesh with me. You will be welcomed in to the very presence of God. Amen. Today you will be with me in paradise. The Lord sent Adam and Eve out of the Garden of Eden. He posted his cherubim with their flaming swords at the gate because sinners do not belong in paradise. Sinners destroyed paradise. Sin has no place in paradise. And so in his perfection, in his wisdom, and in his mercy, the Lord sent them away. He has kept us away so that we would not gaze on that beauty, that tantalizing beauty that we can never reach, so that we would not take that fruit from the tree of life and eat and live forever in our misery, in our pain, in our sickness, in our sin, and in this lost world. Paradise was closed. But now as the Lord hangs there on the cross, He declares to you, those gates are wide open again. You see, every word that Jesus speaks, it should be impossible. Except he speaks it. He carries your sins, your offenses, your guilt. And he says to you, amen. 
today you will be with me in paradise. And as much as we try to avoid it, who wants to talk about death on a beautiful day like today? As much as we push it aside and we distract ourselves and we seek drugs that will extend our life and do all those things, we do all that we can to push death aside. But we all know our days are 70 years or 80 if we have the strength. The day will come when our last breath draws near. And when that day comes, you have the wonderful, confident words of your Lord and Savior to greet you. Amen. I tell you the truth. Today, you will be with me in paradise. Amen. Let us respond with our next hymn. The third word of our Lord from the cross, from John chapter 19. Jesus' mother, his mother's sister, Mary the wife of Clopas, and Mary Magdalene were standing near the cross. When Jesus saw his mother and the disciple whom he loved standing nearby, he said to his mother, Woman, here is your son. Then he said to the disciple, Here is your mother. And from that time on, the disciple took her into his own home. This child is destined to cause the rising and falling of many in Israel. And to be a sign that will be spoken against. 
so that the thoughts of many hearts will be revealed. Who is my mother and who are my brothers? Precious Jesus, you consider us friends and care about the needs of our bodies and souls. Keep us in your care as we walk the road of life and provide the blessings we need to gain safety, contentment, and joy in your service. Amen. We join in singing the song that Mary sang when she heard about the birth, coming birth of her son. The fourth word of our Lord from the cross, from Matthew chapter 27. From the sixth hour until the ninth hour, there was darkness over all the land. About the ninth hour, Jesus cried out in a loud voice saying, Eli, Eli, lama sabachthani, which means, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Why are you so far from saving me, so far from my cries of anguish? My God, 
I cry out by day, but you do not answer. By night, but I find no rest. In that day, declares the Sovereign Lord, I will make the sun go down at noon. And darken the earth in broad daylight. Lord Jesus, you endured the horrific penalty of our sins as your Father turned his face from you on the cross. Compel us to see in your sacrifice the dreadful nature of sin and call us to acknowledge the amazing depth of your love. Overcome our shame, dear Savior, and give us grateful faith. Amen. We sing our next hymn.
the fifth word of our Lord from the cross. After this, knowing that everything had now been finished, and to fill the scripture, Jesus said, I thirst. A jar of sour wine was sitting there, so they put a sponge soaked in sour wine on a hyssop branch and held it to his mouth. My mouth is dried up like a potsherd, and my tongue sticks to the roof of my mouth. I am worn out with calling for help. My throat is harsh. They put gall in my food. And gave me vinegar for my thirst. Dear Jesus, as our brother on earth, you endured the agony of pain that besieged your body when your sacrifice was complete. Knowing our experiences, Hover over us with your care and compassion. When our bodies and our hearts are hurting, provide us with strength that we may confess you with confidence and power. Amen. The next verse is up. The sixth word from John chapter 19. When Jesus had received the sour wine, he said, It is finished. Then bowing his head, he gave up his spirit. On that day, a fountain will be opened to the house of David, 
and the inhabitants of Jerusalem to cleanse them from sin and impurity because of the blood of my covenant with you. I will free your prisoners from the waterless pit. I will remove the sin of this land in a single day. Gracious Redeemer, you paid the full price of our redemption and have released us from forever from the hold of Satan, the power of sin, and the fear of death. Protect us from the devil's claim that we need to do more and from the accusation of our consciences that we have not done enough. Lead us to place our entire confidence in you and to live our lives secure in your grace. Amen. Our next hymn. the seventh word of our Lord from the cross. It was now about the sixth hour, and darkness came over the whole land until the ninth hour, while the sun was darkened. Then the curtain of the temple was torn in two. Jesus cried out with a loud voice, Father, into your hands I commit my spirit. And when he had said this, he breathed his last. Into your hands I commit my spirit. Deliver me, Lord, my faithful God. He has not despised or scorned the suffering of the afflicted one. He has not hidden his face from him, but has he poured out his life unto death 
and was numbered with the transgressors. He bore the sin of many and made intercession for the transgressors. Loving Savior, at the moment of your death, you gave yourself into the loving hands of your Father. As we close our eyes in death, lead us to commit our bodies and souls to him who has summoned us by your name and made us his own because of you and your love. Then we pray, let us depart in peace. Please rise for our reading from the Gospel of John. <clears throat> Since it was the preparation day, the Jews did not want the bodies left on the crosses over the Sabbath because that Sabbath was a particularly important day. They asked Pilate to have the men's legs broken and the bodies taken away. So the soldiers came and broke the legs of the first man who was crucified with Jesus and then those of the other man. But when they came to Jesus and saw that he was already dead, they did not break his legs. Instead, one of the soldiers pierced his side with a spear. Immediately blood and water came out. The one who saw it has testified, and his testimony is true. He knows that he is telling the truth, so that you may believe. Indeed, these things happened so that the scripture would be fulfilled. Not one of his bones would be broken. Again, another scripture says, they will look on the one they have pierced. After this, Joseph of Arimathea, who was a disciple of Jesus, but secretly for fear of the Jews, asked Pilate to let him remove Jesus' body. When Pilate gave him permission, he came and took Jesus' body away. Nicodemus, who earlier had come to Jesus at night, also came bringing a mixture of myrrh and aloes, about 72 pounds. They took Jesus' body and bound it with linen strips along with the spices in accord with the Jewish burial customs. There was a garden at that place where Jesus was crucified. And in the garden there was a noon tomb in which no one had ever been laid. So they laid Jesus' body there because it was the Jewish preparation day and the tomb was near. You may be seated. God most holy, look with mercy on this, your family, for whom our Lord Jesus Christ was willing to be betrayed, be given over into the hands of the wicked, and to suffer death upon the cross. Keep us always faithful to him, our only Savior, who now lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever, amen.
Lord, let at last thine angels come to Abram's bosom bear me home that I may die unfearing and in its narrow chamber keep my body safe in peaceful sleep until thy reappearing and then from death awaken me that these mine eyes with joy may see O Son of God, thy glorious face, my Savior and my fount of grace, Lord Jesus Christ, my prayer attend, my prayer attend. And I will praise thee without end. Brothers and sisters, go in peace.